we trust in God. I hope that's always the case, but continuing in our books. Finally, back to our books, back, chapter 13. No, technically back to our books, but I think it's just the reference at the top of the chapter, chapter 13. It's the start we're going to get today, because it's just a great chapter, as far as in the Psalms there. A great verse to go into. And I think it kind of helps us, which I know is the reason why they put that verse at the beginning of the chapter, kind of begin in the right direction. And I wanted to kind of put a little more emphasis in that right direction. But from our last while, well, several months worth, objective of the adversity, uh, boy, at least 11 weeks, and we had quite a few that we missed because of weather, business meetings, and uh, other events going on. I had to go well back to the fall before when we started this list. Approving holiness, planning for spirit, service, fellowship, leadership, and then deep joy, strength, and last week, glory. The ETA glory, except tiny and mount. And moving to 13, and it has that concept, I think the very title was Choosing to Trust God. From our last, well, from the first 12 chapters of this book, I trust we understand that uh, trusting God is a, it's a good idea. It's a good, it's a good concept to have in our hearts and our minds and our lives. The problem isn't that we don't understand that we ought to trust God. The problem isn't that we um, aren't sure how to do that. The problem, I think, becomes of making the choice to do that. We know we should, but now we need to put it into practice and uh, live it out. And I think it becomes difficult um, when circumstances, when life, when trials, when circumstances, when we looked at last several months, adversity that uh, takes place in our life, we can easily become overwhelmed with the scenario. And uh, not that we chose not to trust God, but because we chose to focus on the circumstance, in so doing, we chose to not trust God. And uh, I think there are times that we need to be reminded of, I've got to choose this. I've got to, it, it's not just a head knowledge. It's not just a, a zeal in the morning that I want to trust God today. But uh, when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, when the trial comes, in fact, you have to trust God whether we're in the mountains or the valleys. Uh, but it's oftentimes when we're in those valley times that it's easy to, um, by neglect, um, neglect to trust our God. So Psalm 42, verse 11, in fact, is the verse I recall that's right at the beginning of the chapter. The psalmist, David says these words, Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. And I kind of look at kind of a three quick points here in regards to Choosing to trust God. The things that we need to grasp in order to make the choice. Uh, to trust God. Number one, we have to understand the distraction. We have to know why it is I don't choose God. What it is that keeps us from choosing God. Uh, what comes a place in my life uh, that causes me to, if nothing else, by neglect. Uh, to not trust my God. And uh, there are a number of, of distractions, but in fact, let me, before we get there, I think I have, nope, I don't have a list there. This word is, why art thou cast down? That cast down is a Hebrew word. Oh, cast down is actually an English word, but in the original, the Hebrew word uh, has an idea of to sink or to press, to bend, to stoop. It has that idea of the pressures on our shoulder to become so heavy that we're no longer able to stand. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And then he asks this question, Why art thou disquieted within me? Now, I suppose simple English would tell me what that definition is, but I have to admit when I first read that, I assumed that I had that idea of just of being quiet, of being still. Um, but obviously the prefix this kind of is a negative, and so literally what it has that idea of not being quiet. Of, of being vocal, being uh, allowed to make it. In fact, it literally means to make a loud sound. And uh, what is interesting in the Hebrew is the, the the connotation of this loud sound is not like we're at the uh, hockey game, like we just did recently, and uh, cheering for the home team. Uh, I believe in the uh, lexicon that I looked at, as far as the meaning of this word, had that idea of, it said the word, to, to speak loudly, and then had a hum. 
But how often have we faced a circumstance where, and we just do that loud, overwhelmed. There have been a few times at work where things get piled on my desk, and then I get this email that, I get emails all day uh, on a very regular basis that always involve some sort of work. Uh, an underwriter wants more information, or an insurer has a question, or someone's turning in a claim, whatever it might be. And a lot of those emails can, can turn around pretty quickly. Uh, someone wants a certificate of insurance, I can pack it up and right back to them, and I'm done with that. But there are some emails that I get that are, oh, very time consuming to give the answer of what is needed there. And uh, I have to admit there have been times that, and I didn't even know this, but I'll be at work and, you know, just overwhelmed with all that's going on. And you, John had just come to my office and left a lot on my desk. And, and then I turn and I get that little ding, got a new email. And it's another thing that is, is just overwhelming. And, and without even me knowing it, I'll do that hum. Oh, and uh, somebody will holler from one of the offices. Many times it's the owner's son who will holler from down the hall. Got a lot going on down there, Art. <laughs> Did I do something out loud? <laughs> yeah, you're just humming down there. I figured you got a lot going on. <laughs> Sorry. I know that, uh, that idea of being just quiet, it has that idea where we can't help but just be verbal and vocal. And I'm not talking about griping and complaining, though. The word literally has an idea of just a loud sigh of, whoa. Now what? How are we going to do this? How are we going to get through this? And why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? And I think the, the first part of verse 11 is a reminder that we have to be, we need to be asking ourselves those questions. We need to be aware of the distractions that cause those questions. Uh, what is causing us to be cast down? What is causing it that is causing us to be disquieted? Uh, go back to the, the early parts of this. Go well, on back to verse 2. Let me read verse 1 because I want to leave it out. The great verse that was uh, Dana Leek's favorite verse. As the deer or as the heart pant after the water, brook soul pant of my soul after thee, O God. Verse 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Who shall I come? When shall I come and appear before God? Now, the kind of the context of this is David has been exiled. He's no longer able to worship where and when as he once did. And obviously in their setting, it was not as our setting. As Christ made it very clear to the Samaritan woman that worship is no longer about in this temple or this mountain. We are just to worship him in spirit and in truth, which gives that idea of it's not location-based. But in David's time frame, this was very location-based. And, and David's one of David's distractions was that the have there, number one, a constant distance from God. When? Shall I come and appear before God? When is, when is this going to end? Look at verse 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. And uh, that verse is as if stating back to verse 2. And I can't do that anymore. Verse 6. Oh my God, oh God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan. Not of the Harmonites from the hill of Mazar. And uh, again, David's long this in literally saying, here's my, one of my distractions. Here's what is causing me to be cast down. Here's what is causing me to be disquieted within me. I, I can't do what I once did as far as my relationship with my God. I can't worship as I once worshiped. Now, that doesn't necessarily, again, apply to us. Because uh, I hope we know this. We don't have to just come to this building to worship God. <laughs> Uh, it's not just confined for Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, our worship of our God, hopefully, takes place every day. And uh, if it doesn't, then what we do here isn't going to uh, accomplish much, much either. But obviously in that day and age, this was a big distress. This was a big heartache upon David's heart. And he's had many psalms that indicate that. That he just longs to be back uh, in the house of his God. There's also a, going back to verse 3, there's a constant weariness, a constant weeping. He says, my tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Has that idea of while others are going through the routine of their days, uh, David's routine has been, been changed. 
for those that have uh, lost a loved one, not this even Bob were on our prayer list this weekend. Uh, it was quite a, uh, I went into that, it was quite a uh, turnout for the visitation on Sunday afternoon. We got there even five, ten minutes early before it started. And uh, already at that point, we had to wait over an hour just to get in. Um, and so a tremendous turnout at the church auditorium. This the auditorium was being used as a holding area. And then uh, as they filled up row after row after row, and every row, <laughs> like our church, Every row, and it was just what is there like four sections? Maybe you might know more than I remember, but I think it's four sections, kind of like this, and uh, except the whole. <laughs> and uh, every section, well, they had chairs, not pews, but every section would have uh, like 40 people in it. They'd fill it up, and then as the line would go down, they'd dismiss one pew at a time. So 40 people would get up and leave and get in line then. And in the meantime, they would have this. You know, the big screen with the pictures of uh, little Levi. And, and uh, anyway, we've all been through those circumstances, even in our own lives, where we have had somebody that we love that we've lost. And in those, especially those first days, there is no routine most of the time. <clears throat> there may be no hunger. There may be no, nah, I just don't even want to eat. I can't eat. I feel like eating. Or the other side of the coin, I want to eat all the time. <laughs> I can't stop eating. Uh, it doesn't matter what time it is, I want to eat some more. And uh, our sleepy gets thrown off. Our, every, all of our routine, it doesn't matter. In fact, we're usually not going to be going to work. And all of that just completely changes us. What David is saying here is, while everybody else is going on with the routine, mine is not. And what is replacing my normal routine is this. My tears, my tears are flowing as though as a minute routine and uh, uh, what a, a, a reality that David has that his distractions are constant from God but as well a, a constant doesn't say the word weariness it uses the word tears which has an idea of weeping uh, but you can almost read in between the lines of just the weariness of weeping everybody else is going on but here I am and I'm still I'm still here in great turmoil and great weeping and then jumping to verse 7, it says, Deep calleth on the deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Had the uh, opportunity to be on both of our surrounding oceans on both coasts um, in my lifetime, and as well as the Gulf, and I guess the same ocean, but in Peru as well. Um, but there's something amazing about being on the, the shores of the ocean. And uh, there are times when the waves are somewhat minimal. When I say minimal, as far as the ocean goes, it's still pretty big for like, like Michigan goes. Um, but then there are times when the waves are just massive. And, but either way, if you've ever started an ocean, even to a great point, even like a, a lake like, like Michigan, uh, where the waves just come And uh, that's the, literally what the idea is. Deep calls on the deep. The noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. And it's what David is saying, I'm calling it a constant bombardment. They've ever had a circumstance where it seems like one thing right after the next, after the next, like the waves coming in, coming back out, coming in, coming back out. Uh, what David is crying out here in verse 7 is saying it, it's just constant. One after the next, after the next, after the next. And uh, if, if that can't, if that isn't a distraction, I'm not sure what would be a distraction. I, I know I'm certain we've all lived that, verse 7. Maybe not to the extent of David. Uh, but we all know what that feels like when one thing happens after another thing. And it's just one right after the other, like the waves coming in. And uh, certainly that becomes a great distraction. And if these distractions that... Again, by our overwhelmed hearts that we neglect to choose our God, to choose to trust our God. A constant bombardment. Well, then as well, the last two verses, or not the last two, verses 9 and 10. The last two before we get the verse that we started with. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, and we already read this earlier in the chapter, where is thy God? 
Paul had a constant sense, for lack of a better word, of loneliness. And I'm not talking about David not having anybody with him. We know that there were people with him. Uh, but the very reality of the relationship of him and his God, this felt like, God, where are you? And uh, the fact that now twice he's already mentioned that others are asking him, where's that God? Uh, it says David is in that time, which I know we have also faced, again, not to his extent perhaps, but he faced those times where others ask us, where's that God? And we're not quite sure what the answer is. It seems to be what David is going through right here. It's, it's, uh, it's a heartache to my, my very bones because I'm being asked this question and, and I don't, I'm asking, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Why, why aren't you here with me? And it's in one of those distractions which I think is an interesting side note. Notice that David's distractions here in this chapter that led him to the question, why are you cast down? <laughs> why are you disquieted within me? It's not because uh, he's not complaining about the car breaking down, or in his case, the chariot having a broken tire. <laughs> uh, he's not talking about a leaky roof. He's not talking about having to eat the same food again and again. He's not talking about... All the things that many times become our distractions. His distractions, if you look at this list, were, in essence, focused right back to our God. It was the spiritual walk. It was the spiritual uh, relationship with his God that was at, that was suffering right here. And uh, what a reminder for us how we make uh, the temporary, make the material such uh, paramount to our lives today. And we neglect what is most important. Choosing to trust God, the distractions. Then we come back to uh, verse 11. Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? We've gone back to the beginning and looked at several, four specific distractions that seem to be evident in those in this chapter of, of what has caused David to be cast down and what has caused him to be disquieted. Notice this next phrase, hope thou in God. Kind of all combined into one. It's a, it's a, a question and a, a command and uh, almost a rebuke at the same time. Why don't we put our trust fully in Him? They call this, like Asian guy, two explanations there. Here's a, a double emphasis on not only the distraction, but the waiting. Hope thou in God. That word hope is literally, again, back in the Hebrew, has that idea of an aspect of, of waiting. Hoping and waiting. And, uh, to hope in God, it's certainly to trust in God, to hope in God, it's certainly to uh, expect great things from God. Who was that that said that? I forget. I think it was. Is it one it seems that way, yes. Certainly hope in God is to expect great things from God. Uh, hope in God is certainly to have confidence in God when everything else seems to be falling apart. But there is an aspect of that hope, of that waiting, that involves... Well, when things get farther than we ever thought they could get. Waiting in and of itself, as far as the connection of hope and waiting, waiting in and of itself kind of has an idea of, of, of time passing. And uh, notice that David didn't have instantaneous results here. Lord, where are you? Boom, there's an earthquake. There's a, you know, a firestorm. And oh, there you are. Uh, there wasn't an instantaneous response that, that, that David senses here in, in chapter 42, although he knew that God was still there. And there are times in our own lives where the waiting on God involves the passing of time. And uh, it, it's that aspect of, of hope that realizes that the hope is something beyond this now, uh, this moment. Uh, where I am right now, that there are times that God allows me to stay here in the circumstance, in the, in the situation, in, the, in, in life, for my gain, for my benefit. But the timing involves some time. It involves the passing of time. But there's also another aspect of, uh, as I have there, a concept of hope, a concept of waiting that is not based on our solutions as well. And it's an amazing aspect that so many times that God challenges us in our hope in our waiting upon him and uh, i'm not trying to what i'm trying to say minimize the concept of who our god is but in human terms it's almost as if he's waiting and slowly taking away all of our options away if, if you know what i'm trying to say here 
Uh, he knows what he's going to do. He knows what's going to be taking place in my life. And he knows in my mind, I've got plan A, B, C, and D. But he knows that I need to learn how to wait on him. So what does he begin to do? Option A. I'm sorry, listen. Option A is Pierce. No longer a viable option. But I still got B, C, and D. And then uh, B is Pierce. It's all right. I still got two choices here. We're still good. And then C and then D. And normally it's in that moment that our response is, well, there is nothing that God can do now. At this moment, my hoping, my waiting on God is done because there is nothing more that can be done. But we have to remind ourselves that I need to choose to trust God, being aware of the distractions and asking myself the question that David asked, why, why am I feeling this way? Why am I like this? What has caused this? And I need to Maybe even write it down. What is causing me to be not choosing to trust my God? What is causing me to neglect trusting God? But I also have to be reminded of that aspect of waiting that God sometimes puts us through in, in waiting. Remember Gideon? As he sees his army disappear. <laughs> uh, how often has God allowed us, in our own minds anyway, to think that we had an ar entire army at our disposal, and then one by one, that army begins to disappear and dwindle? And in our mind, we go from this is going to be easy to this is not going to be so easy to this is not going to be, this is going to be very hard to this is going to be impossible. But our God still does that. Yeah, imagine the, uh, of the reality of, of uh, what was that? Uh, John chapter 6? <clears throat> Excuse me, the raising of uh, Lazarus. Talk about having a conclusion of, this is too late. What did the sisters say, Lord, if you would have been here? But now, <laughs> as he calls for the tomb, to, the stone to be removed, no, it's too late. He stinks. There, there's, there's, there's nothing that can be done now. He stinks. Now, we know, I trust we know, we, we would acknowledge that Les was actually dead. He wasn't just, kind of like the same arguments they give for Christ. Uh, he, he was, this wasn't a whole food theory that he kind of fainted and he came back to life in the coolness of the, uh, of the tomb. Lazarus was actually dead. And uh, because of that, and the fact that days had gone by, Lazarus was actually, this sounds morbid, but decaying. And because of that, Lazarus actually was stinking. And as far as humanity, as far as our thinking would go, I choose to trust God, and we can almost see that in the sisters' responses. Uh, Mary and Martha, we, chose, we choose to trust you, but that would have been two days ago. That would have been three days ago. That would have been last week. Now, there are no options. What are... We, it's not stated there in John, but in essence, what are the options now of trust? There's nothing more that you can do. It's too late. I think if we would have been able, which would have been quite probably morbid and probably quite disgusting, but quite marvelous to watch, if there could have been a, you know, a little closed caption camera inside that tomb. And uh, literally to be able to watch, and this would be the disgusting part of his body literally became uh, in the coolness of that, that tomb. And uh, how the skin would morph and the eye sockets would disappear and, and or sink and, and all the things that would take place, even in just a matter of a few days, especially since they didn't do like the embalming even that we do today. But then to be able to, at the moment, can you imagine that, especially if this closed caption camera would have uh, uh, audio abilities, to be able to hear the voice of the creator of the universe say, hey, down to move that, that stone, and then you begin to hear the arguments that are taking place outside and you know here we're just in the dark tomb but you hear the arguments taking place we have our audio but while they are arguing imagining watching this body and again this is reading between the lines taking a little liberty here but watching it as uh the the eyes begin to take shape again so after three days they probably have um, quite sunken by that point and they begin to take shape again and the skin that was beginning to turn almost uh uh what do you call that you can see through it opaque is that the right word Translucent, yeah, whatever that word would be, uh, begins to take its uh, rigidity again and, and begins to take its shape again. And, and while there's arguing going on outside of why we can't, inside that tomb, 
the one who was decaying, the one who was thinking, the one who was indeed dead, stands up and approaches that stone and is being rolled away. I just can't imagine we could have seen that reality, but they did from the outside. They saw that. There are times when I'm, I guess, sometimes I wonder how old I am. Sometimes I want to think that I'm much younger than I am. But there have been times that I've sat on the couch or whatever, and you know, on Saturday nights I spend with my laptop in my lap and get the PowerPoint and the bulletin and all those details. And many times that this day in history, it's been my routine for a Saturday evening. And, and I saw me sitting down on the couch with the laptop in my lap for several hours, doing all that, getting it all done and ready for Sunday morning. And uh, then it'll be time to get up money and just be to go to use the restroom or get a snack or whatever it might be. And uh, if you're like me, you stand up and it's like, you know, my back hurts, my feet are, you, gotta, you almost got like one ankle sound of sleep or something, and you're, you're kind of looking. Lazarus has been laying completely motionless because he was completely dead for three days, and he stands up and he walks out of the tomb. The waiting that's involved has a concept of, of time, but trusting God should not have any reliance upon time. Waiting and trusting in God has a concept of, of, of our solutions, of, of our plans A, B, C, and D. But truly trusting God should not be contingent upon how many more options are still on the table. Because truly learning to trust God is a matter of hoping in Him, of waiting upon Him, of realizing that God is the God of the impossible. And uh, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could acknowledge and choose to trust God to the point of you hold these things, but let's move the stone and see what happens. Uh, that we can live that kind of a life of truly waiting, of truly hoping, of, tr of truly being a, a participant, but also a spectator of what God is doing. And uh, what a, a challenge that would be. If we can learn how to choose to trust God, if we can truly trust God, even in the hardest of circumstances. And this last point I'm going to call the contag contagion. I just lost how to say that. That word. Many times, obviously, that's used to discuss a, uh, a disease and uh, the spreading of a disease. But there's something amazing here in this chapter. If you go back, let me, let me just read for a refresher in our minds, verse 11, because I've read most of the other verses of this chapter already. Verse 11, the verse we started with, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now go to uh, verse 5. This should sound relatively familiar. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. Up to that point, word for word, verses 5 and 11. For I shall yet praise him. That's very similar, if I recall. For I shall yet praise him. So even to that point, word for word. Then notice what it says in verse 5. For the help of his countenance. Been to a number of piano recitals, not because I've played a single one, uh, but because my wife has had quite a few. Um, and something that I have obviously observed as a father of some of those piano students, but as well just as an observer of piano students and even the contest that she just recently judged there in uh, Wyoming. I always marvel at who does the child look at after they finished. You know, you can see the nerves uh, as they slowly make their way to the piano and as they fidget there to get started and get their music. You can see that these poor kids are just as nervous as nervous to be. Probably the most nervous thing they overwhelming thing they've done in their life at that point. A <laughs> little bit they know what will yet come in their life. But at that point, that's, that's the worst thing they've ever had to face, is playing in front of an audience. And then they make their way through that song and some of them have been like perfect and others Perhaps less than perfect, but uh, in finally all the cases I've seen, even in those cases, they, they continued on and they finished. And it's amazing whether it be here or uh, at the nursing home or at the library or at the bistro or in the Wyoming school. And as they step up from the piano and they turn back to the audience that has watched them, where do they look first? And I, I just kind of, you know, I'm playing times just watch people. I often take note, who do they look to first? And then there are times that, uh, as a father, 
I take great joy when they look to me first and say, Mom. <laughs> Which doesn't always happen for very often because she's the piano teacher and the mom. But what a great joy when they'll turn around and, and they'll make eye contact with Dad, with me. And, uh, and I know that even if things have not gone well, and I've noticed this with other parents as well, even if this was a real struggle, this, it was, whether it was their nerves or what it was, it was just a real struggle. You gotta be, you gotta be positive. You gotta smile. You know, give them a thumbs up. And the pride, if you can say that word consciously in a church, <laughs> the pride of knowing that your kid just did that. They just finished it. It wasn't easy and it wasn't challenging, but they did it. They finished it. They completed it. And uh, I think there's something that is greatly to be said about those, the countenance of the one they looked to first. And how sad there have been times, especially in Wyoming, not. I, I don't know that I've ever noticed it before with my wife's piano students, but most of them come from church backgrounds and homeschooled and close connection with their parents. I know in Wyoming there's been a number of times when the kid has stood up, turned around, and uh, kind of went to the ground. He's got nobody to look at. And uh, there's no response back, even if mom or dad or both are there sitting in the chairs. There's no response. And uh, my heart kind of breaks up. I kind of want to just talk a little louder for them or go up and you know, give them a we call it a, a fist bump. And uh, hey, you did a great job. And it breaks my heart when I see these kids struggling with the most important thing of their life at every moment. And uh, they have no countenance to look at. Nothing to be an encouragement to them to say, you did it. <laughs> it's done. Let's go get some ice cream now. <laughs> what, what did David say in here in verse 5? Why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. And then verse 5 breaks from what we already read in verse 11 for the help of his countenance. It's almost as if David's saying, because I have heard verse 5 up on the screen, because of God's smile. Now that's kind of taking in a uh, kind of again negating God to the aspect of man, uh, but it kind of gives us that picture of, of what is being said here in verse 5 because of the smile of God, because of the very countenance of God that. David is able to know by the very countenance of God that he is loved. Uh, and what a challenge that is, what a reminder that is, what a, a precious aspect of that uh, uh, that is there. Choosing to trust God, asking myself the question, why am I not? And, and even naming, we want to name and claim it principle here. Name it and claim it. Here's what's distracting me. I need to make sure it's not a distraction in my life. And reminding ourselves of the way that it's a concept of hope. I will hope in God. It involves waiting. It's not based on time. In other words, as time goes by, it doesn't make it impossible to continue waiting. It, it, hoping and waiting upon our God is not contingent upon time or our solutions. God is a God of the impossible. But we also need to be reminded of the very smile of our God, the very countenance of our God. But look at verse 11 then. Same beginning. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. Who is the health of my countenance and my God? And uh, if we could have a contagious aspect here, what David is pointing out here in the, the midpoint of this chapter is, I'm going to hope in my God, I'm going to trust in my God because his very love for me, his very countenance for me is one that is, it, it reminds me that I need to trust. And he concludes this chapter, six verses later, with the very reality of, I'm, you know, here's the question I'm going to ask myself. I'm going to choose to wait. I'm going to choose to hope in my God because what I saw in his countenance is now a help to my countenance. And I'm going to have the joy, if we can say it this way, the joy of the Lord in my life. I'm going to have the confidence in my God because of what he has on his countenance is impacting what is on my countenance because he is, as he says there at the last phrase, He's my God. He's my God. And it may not be the reality of a true trust in God, but the contagious aspect of the countenance of our God then assisting us and helping us in our own countenance in uh, whatever may fall us, whatever we may face, whatever circumstances that we find ourselves in, even if days and solutions have gone by, even if in our greatest argument you say it's too late now, time too much time has passed. Lord has done three days, he stinks now. 
Or if our solutions are gone, where, you know, had you been here before his death, we had solutions. We just needed you to be here. But when may we choose to trust God, not depending on those things, reminding ourselves of the distractions so that we might overcome them, we might get beyond them, and remind ourselves of God's countenance for us, and how it impacts our countenance as well. Choosing to trust God. I guess I can't say next week. We won't be back here in this chapter next week, probably. And the very next week, I we may wind up being Mr. Cole's week. But that's about to do already. I'm trying to do that once a month. And so it may be a couple of weeks before we get back to this and actually begin the chapter. <laughs> uh, well, I thought it was a great verse to start us off, but we're choosing to trust our God. I'm actually like eight minutes early. Do we have any comments, questions? Any stories you want to share of behold these things? So there's definitely been times in our life, in our marriage even, in the last so many years of our, 24 years now of our lives together, that it seems like God has brought us to the behold these things point and uh, done what we didn't think he could do. And uh, I think that helps us in the next time to be able to trust him, but it still requires us to make the choice to trust him, choose to trust him. Uh, but knowing that he is the God of Lazarus and knowing that he's the God of Gideon and knowing that he's the God of David, and knowing that he's the God of Abraham, he stood there with a knife in his hand, ready to slay his own son. Uh, we should be able to trust our God, regardless of time, regardless of our circumstances, and our solutions to those circumstances, to be able to choose to trust him. Any thoughts? Second row? 16-year-olds? You're not old enough to vote here, so you're definitely old enough to talk. No, nothing. This isn't about this lesson, but this morning um, we were having our Bible time. The subject was on jealousy. But what was just fascinating as I just thought as we were listening, um, this was when we were listening to we do our kids. <coughs> Once in a while we listen to someone reading us a, a devotional. And the subject was jealousy, but he took it to the fact that jealousy is discontentment, and discontentment is not trusting God. Yes. And so then we could talk about the fact that that's what Wednesday night has been all about. And it, that was, it's not this particular week, but it was just a real blessing to two things, to be able to take something that was a different subject in a way, but it took us right to the root, and the root was not trusting God. And it just struck me how, this is what we've been learning on Wednesdays, but how many actions, attitudes, reactions all boil down to one root. It's not trusting God. Because if I trusted God, I'd be content. If I was content, yes. I'd have nothing to ever be jealous about. And it was on a kid's level, but it reaches to everyone. And I was yes. just, it was just pretty exciting as it's happening. I could hardly wait for him to finish because I was like, Wednesday night, this is how we're learning that. Yes. Yes. Um, so that was the blessing. Yes. I would dare say, I'm sorry, I've said this before, I would dare say there's a lot of physical ailments that come because we simply neglect to trust our God. Uh, certainly a lot of mental. I know that mental illness is a big issue today. And uh, a lot of it, unfortunately, is because the loss of trying to find some answers outside of God. And uh, it, it, it doesn't work. And, and you can't make connections that way. Um, but I think there's a lot of even... Christians who had us have a lot of their minds are not at ease. And uh, it could be a whole host of reasons, but I think one of them, a, a large one of them, is not choosing to trust their God. And uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a simple problem to discuss, which we've been discussing for over a year now. Uh, but when you look at all the ramifications of not trusting God, uh, oh, like that, yeah, that's a perfect illustration because one leads to the next, which leads to the next, which leads to the next, and the funnel just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, because I simply made the point of not trusting God, now we're building upon another, upon another, upon another, and it's impacting more and more of my life in a very negative way uh, because I didn't do the simple thing of just trusting, choosing to trust God. Um, I say it's simple, but when you're running out of time, you're running out of solutions. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not often simple. So, give you another opportunity.
you you mentioned kind of <coughs> the whole David and claimant <laughs> yeah. concept, and it made me think about there are things we can claim. One of them is our eternity. Yes. And the other one I can claim, and he definitely talks about that in the psalm, is that God is always present with us. We maybe go through some kind of deep waters and where are you, God? Yes. But he's still there. Correct. You know, and we'll, he'll help us get through this thing if, if we trust him. Right. And we'll sense, when we get through it, we'll sense, you really did get me through this. Exactly, yes. You are here. Even exactly. though it seemed like he was a million miles away. Correct. At time. Yes. Which seems to be what David's saying there as well. You know, the last words. And my God. A lot takes place in our lives. So a lot of things place in David's life. Um, we have to be able to choose trust. From the one of the two verses that were about five and nine or eleven, 11, 11. where we just saw God, but then through that, God changed his countenance. Correct. Him. Yes. So that he was, you know, living, you know, trusting God, and, and he knew that God was there and Correct. helping him through it. Correct. And even if he's going through some kind of battle, he knows that he he can smile in spite of the. Conflicts because you know you've got to them. Yes, it's a good point. Let me use it the last. Let me let me talk now so I can get too late. Get them on. <laughs> no, that it's easy when we know Psalm forty-two and then we just gone over it. Well, you know, I'm facing the house. So I'm gonna make sure I'm smiling. <laughs> we force it, and because uh, I want to have that good, I want to have other people look and notice that I'm doing this right. Um, but to be able to have the humility, to have the honesty, of that that. David surely had here as he cries out to God in this psalm. And uh, he, as my dad just said, he allowed God to change his comments. And uh, there's a great difference between when I force it and when it's genuine, when it truly is God-driven change in my comments because of who he is, because of what he has done. And uh, I, I think that there are times that we, uh, you know, when I was a kid, when you fell down, you cried, and as you got older, your parents said, you know, you don't need to cry anymore. <laughs> Just get back up and be a big boy or a big girl or whatever it would be. And uh, so I think sometimes in our Christian life, we try to do the same thing. I'm, 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 I've got to force it so that even though everything hurts, I'm not going to cry. And even though the lips start to quiver a little bit, but we're not going to cry. We're, not gonna, we're, we're, gonna be, we're too old for that. And uh, it's a sad reality when we force... We force the countenance without the trust. And by trusting, we allow God to change our countenance. And what a difference that makes in our countenance, because it's not a forced thing. It's not the, everybody sees the quiver. <laughs> uh, as I was leaving work today, a bunch of kids playing basketball. You, bigger kids on one end, and the younger kids were down at where I was parked. And just as I started up the van, there was, I think it was a girl sitting down, I would guess maybe seven or eight years old, sitting on the court. The kid shot a Little, little, little guy shot a basketball and then ran backwards to get the rebound and toppled right over this girl that was sitting right there. It was like, uh, you couldn't have planned it any better as far as that worked out, uh, as far as bad timing, bad placement. And the kid smacked the concrete. In fact, I, I immediately, you know, I was right here, ready to put it in reverse, put it right back in the park, like, that had to hurt. And this poor kid, you know, he's doing his best. He sits up, and you know, these kids run around, are you okay, okay? And you, I just saw his... His tongue was just, or his little under lip, their lower lip, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. This thing here, 
He's just going, just quivering. I knew it's coming. It's gonna come. It, it's Heathrow. And then <laughs> he let loose. And then some other Lord bigger kid came up, gave him a hug or something, and he seemed to be fine and ran off and kept playing basketball. But how often in our our Christian walk we force? I got to do this. I got to. I'm not going to ask questions like David did. I'm not going to say, Lord, why am I like this? And consider why it is that I am like this. We're going to force it, and it's fortunate we not only neglect and miss the opportunity to truly learn what it is to trust God, but we truly miss the benefit of God changing our comments of that contagion of that contagious aspect of his comments being reflected in ours and uh, so I don't know if I don't say this in the simplest terms but sometimes it's okay to cry is that the right way of saying that sometimes it's alright to ask the questions of our God so that he can do a work in our hearts so that there's a genuine change of our hearts change of our focus, change of our lives and as we see David do repeatedly in the Psalms, Lord why have you forsaken me on not every place in who you are we see God changing his heart, changing his comments, and in that way, we can trust God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for who you are. I thank you for uh, well, you are a God that we can trust. I thank you that regardless of the circumstances, uh, even when time and our solutions have disappeared, that you are still a God of the impossible, a God that is still trustworthy, a God that we can still hope in. And I thank you for that. And as we even consider the very reality of what it means to wait on you, as we consider the very reality of the distractions of our lives and what keeps us from choosing to trust you, I pray that we would be reminded again and again of the, your countenance upon us and that we would allow that to change our very countenance because you are our God. And I thank you for that. I pray that we live it. And uh, while certainly we're not always going to have uh, the greatest expectations of every event, unfortunately, but that regardless of what we face, <laughs> we know that you are a God of the impossible. And because of that, we can trust. And we can trust even in the impossible. We can thank you that you are the God of the impossible. And uh, I pray that you work through us, strengthen us, and keep our focus on you. Come what may, in Jesus' name.